I'm really excited to have this watch in for review today. It's an Arcos Tropos, and what makes this watch so unique? It's the only microband watch I'm aware of that is a mono pusher chronograph. Um, and also, price wise, if you're interested in adding a mono pusher chronograph to your watch collection, maybe that's something you don't have and you collect interesting movements. Uh, this is basically the only one I know out there uh, that's a microband, and price wise, I just don't know anything that's remotely like this as a mono pusher, and if you're paying north of a couple of thousand US dollars. So this is in the um, price range of, I think the uh, full retail is $800, $799, but it's currently available on pre-order until the 15th of uh, November, possibly later. They're taking pre-orders certainly till the 15th of November, and that's $100 less at $699. Uh, which also includes, as well as this uh, bracelet, it includes a leather strap as well. So, you know, price-wise, definitely extremely good value if you're after a mono pusher. And uh, also pretty unique as a watch. I'm very impressed by the fact that they've come up with this. And the story behind it is even more interesting. We'll talk about the watch, the features, um, you know, the look, dimension, specs, that kind of thing in a minute. But just to paint a picture about this brand, this is their very first watch, and then they... They landed with a splash. Definitely bringing out a mono pusher is extremely interesting. Um, who knows what they're going to do next? Maybe a flyback chronograph or, or something even more extreme. Um, but anyway, uh, the fact that they've come out with this, uh, the way they've done this is uh, they're two best friends, basically. Um, they've been friends for a very long time, uh, Raphael and Jarno. Um, Rafa's an electrical engineering background, but for about six years or so, he's been a watchmaker. And uh, he's, he's the gentleman that actually assembles these watches. And Jarno has a mechanical engineering background and, and is responsible for the mechanical design. And what they've done is they've adapted an existing SD19 movement, uh, replacing several of the parts uh, with their own parts that they actually machine themselves literally in-house, I believe at home, where they have their own CNC machines. Now that's super cool. It's a genuine micro brand that's assembling the watches themselves in-house, but they also have machinery to make parts that are accurate to a small fraction of a millimeter. Like, I don't know what the uh, calibration is. It's like a tenth of a millimeter or, you know, whatever it is, less than a human hair's width. Really accurately made parts. And they're not just putting a movement into a case and assembling a watch, you know, attaching the you know, the uh, hands, the, the dial and everything else. Uh, but they're basically opening up the movement, taking it out, cleaning it, stripping it, reassembling it, replacing parts in the movement with their own custom made parts to turn an SD90 movement into a mono pusher. So I'm super impressed. If this is their very first release, it's definitely something that you wouldn't expect. It's um, kind of a bold step. Um, and their background in mechanical engineering and watchmaking make it an extremely good, uh, good I mean just a, a, a just a great start I can't think of a, another way of putting it they're just off to an exceptional start and I'm very impressed the fact that they've been able to do this so what is a mono pusher well basically a normal chronograph would have a stop and start pusher here so one press would start the chronograph which is basically a stopwatch second press would stop it and there'll be another pusher here pretty much looking the same as the first one typically where you press it and it resets and brings the second hand and maybe the minute timer if you're timing more than a minute um, all the way back to reset it to the zero or the start position. So you could do a different timing later on. So you could basically stop, start, reset. And all a mono pusher is really, it's more like an interesting thing to have in your collection. It doesn't really add extra functionality. All that functionality is built now into a single hand. It's more like because we can do it, we did it kind of a thing, if you like. Um, so I press this once, the chronograph starts. So you see the second hand sweeping there. Um, this is an ST19 base movement, so it's going to be... Um, oh, I'm doing this from memory here. It's uh, 21,800, or is it? I, th I think it's 21,006. I can never remember. But anyway, it's basically six ticks per second. It's a low beat movement. Uh, and you basically can press it again to stop. And normally you'd press a button on the left here, uh, but I'm just pressed the same button to reset it. So all in all, very simple and very nice functionality and something very unusual if you don't have in your collection. So um, yes, I'm kind of blowing hot about this. I'm excited about it. Um, definitely as something I don't have, I'm interested in this watch. And this is why I was really happy to do the review. 
course, there are other features of the watch you might want to look at and consider the price point, the aesthetics, and so on. You, if you know, if you've got to like the look of a watch before you go for it. So, you know, not the only deciding factor on whether you want to get the watch, but certainly for somebody who collects chronographs, and I've got a huge number of ST19s at this point because it is my favorite movement. I do not have a mono pusher, so um, I'm certainly tempted by this, uh, but I have absolutely no skin in the game here. Um, just to explain my situation, uh, I liked the look, the look of the design, uh, and they showed me a little video over um, Facebook Messenger some time ago now, and I got super excited about it, so I asked to review it, and they kindly were able to send me this prototype. I have absolutely no skin in the game, however. I get I don't get to keep the watch. It's going right back as soon as I'm done. I don't get compensated in any way. We're not going to be selling this in the microbrand store. Uh, they don't have the margin, despite the cost here, to sell any other way other than direct, because it's a huge amount of work for them to open up each of the movements, change the parts. I mean, manufacturing the parts as well is pretty darn expensive. Uh, and uh, do all the work that's necessary to get a really nicely running movement like this. But there's a huge plus to, to this as well. I mean, not only are they going to be very capable of servicing the movements, if, if indeed there is an issue or something, but, you know, the winding on this, it's just buttery smooth. I just, um, I have never seen that any microbrand watch, whether it's... Um, a Swiss ETA Valjo 7750 or another ST19, any that wind as smooth as this, it feels like um, people that are into many micro brands, for example, feels like it could be a Grupo Gamma uh, three-piece uh, watch or something. The uh, winding is really good. On my time grapher, it's like completely straight lines, you know, no dots or speckling, uh, 0, 0.0 milliseconds beat error, so perfect no beat error. Uh, 309 degrees amplitude, so that's perfect, very healthy amplitude, exactly what I'd like to see. Um, this isn't a regulated watch, and I do understand that for the production watches, they're going to be somewhere between minus 5 and plus 10 seconds uh, per day accuracy. Uh, but that's still extremely good for the price. Um, it's not going to be up there with... Um, you know, ones that are regulated to two or three seconds, but you're really going for the mono pusher here. So the one thing I really love about ST19 chronographs, doesn't matter whether it's got a mono pusher or not, is the, uh, I'll try and get the focus on this if I can, um, here we go, is the exhibition case back um, is always a lot going on, always a lot to see, always very interesting. So it's a fully mechanical chronograph. Uh, let's talk about the ST19, which this is based off of, then we'll jump into the specs and everything else. So the ST19 started life as the Venus 175, which is, Venus was a Swiss brand, and then um, the ST19, so the Venus 175 was acquired by Seagull, a Chinese brand, who I believe acquired the blueprints, uh, blueprints sorry, and also acquired some machinery and started manufacturing a slightly improved version. And this has been around for decades, so it, it's not a new movement. It's got a lot of interesting history behind it. A lot of people collect ST19 watches, partly because of the gorgeous exhibition case back and being a full mechanical, partly for the history. I mean, there's a, um, there's a 1963, um, I believe, uh, Chinese Air Force watch that people are really into or into reproductions of that, uh, which uh, this movement was used for. Um, obviously without this a mono pusher adaption, but you know, the, the standard ST19 movement. So a lot of interesting history, it used to be Swiss, it used to be used in watches like the Breitling Chronomat, so it was used in luxury watches back in the day. So you've got a movement with some history, a mono pusher, a gorgeous exhibition case back. And let's face it, if you want to get a full mechanical watch, Really, um, if you're not going to go for an ST19 based watch, probably your next option is to go for something, you know, price point wise, is to go for uh, an ETA Valjo 7750 or a member of that family. And then the movement itself is going to cost more than a watch like this typically um, uh, in the normal price point for an ST19. Um, yeah, so I mean, basically, you uh, at a pre-order price for uh, seven seven fifty, you're going to be paying eight hundred or nine hundred dollars as a minimum, uh, and uh, for retail price, well over a thousand dollars. So, you know, it's a really good price point. Basically, ST 19s fill this niche between cheap, affordable, ten dollars to two hundred and fifty dollar quartz watches, or you know, uh, slightly more expensive but still fairly affordable. Um, Mecha quartz watches, which is basically quartz watches with mechanical push actions. 
but a full mechanical watch, really the ST19 is the only affordable one that costs typically in the uh, mid hundreds of dollars range. You know, maybe you can get a cheap one, um, but you really want to, it's, it's, it's like a movement, it's like the, um, like a, a basic, basic Seiko movement. Uh, you can get a, one slapped in in a, a Chinese factory somewhere where they're in a rush mass producing and maybe the quality is not that good. Uh, maybe it's not going to last so long. Or you can have a really one that's stripped down and dealt with by a watchsmith and reassembled. Costs a bit more money, but it's still a, a, a very nicely running watch. And this falls into the second category because these guys, you know, with the smooth winding, the accuracy, uh, or at least in terms of uh, maybe not actually in terms of uh, seconds per day, but the accuracy in terms of uh, how smoothly it's running, how well it's, you know, it's, it's running like a literally a world old machine, which in fact it is. So um, super happy about that. So let's talk a bit more about the features and so on. This uh, is a 39 millimeter diameter watch. So basically it's going to fall between that 38, 40 millimeter sweet spot that seems to be really popular right now. Uh, the height is only 12.5 millimeters. It might look a little bit taller here, and that's simply because of several features. One is it's got a high box dome, uh, not so high box sapphire crystal on the top, uh, with a re actually a really nice uh, kind of magnification uh, distortion effect on the edge, but it doesn't stop you seeing the time accurately, but it's a nice touch. Um, and in straight side, so it does tend to look a bit taller than it actually is, but the, the um, height on this is actually extremely good considering a chronograph has subdials, um, and it's also really nicely done. You can see the finishing on this, if I bring this up close, try and get the focus on it a bit better. Um, yeah, so you can see not only is the uh, top and kind of bezel fully polished as well as in the bottom of the case but there's also some slight um, kind of a chamfered uh, very fine polished edge along the sides and very fine brushing so a nicely contrasted finish box sapphire crystal sapphire crystal on top with a uh, blue anti-reflective coating underneath too they've uh, not cut corners um, which is good uh, which so they also have a sapphire crystal underneath. Uh, sapphire crystal is the one you want to go for because it's scratch resistant pretty much. Uh, normally not an issue when it's on the wrist but uh, for the back but the front that's usually pretty important. You don't want to scuff up a watch and in my opinion the worst one to go for is mineral glass but anyway sapphire crystal definitely a plus. Uh, so we've talked about 49 uh, sorry 39 millimeter diameter. The lug to lug length that's from here to here uh, which is truly how well it will fit on your wrist depending on what wrist size you've got is 47 and a half millimeters and it's got a 20 millimeter lug width which is very standard and this bracelet here tapers down to 18 from 20. It is a fully screwed link bracelet and um, obviously a machine clasp. It has a uh, double pushes which is great um, and obviously the Ar Arcus label as well. Um, now you might notice this one only has two adjusts in the uh, micro adjusts. In the final production version there are going to be three. However it's kind of interesting. I have an exactly six and a half inch wrist. I'll just get this on my wrist for a few seconds uh, so you can take a look. And um, I resized this twice just to experiment seeing how it worked with two pushes. And uh, you know it worked out pretty nice for me. So um, Basically, this fits really comfortably. This is exactly how I want this. I initially took out five links for six and a half inch wrist, which each link's about a centimeter. Um, I believe uh, six and a half inches always get mixed up a bit, but I think that's like 19 centimeters or so. Each link's just about a centimeter or fractionally under. Uh, so I took out five links and it was a, and used the outer micro adjust of these two micro adjusts. And it was a tight fit, not tight as in leaving a mark, but just a comfortable tight fit. If I wanted to you know, do some sports or something, I'd probably have it set to that. But I put one link back in and went to the inner micro adjust. And this is exactly how I'd like to wear my watch most of the time. I can force a finger in there if I need to, but it's not going to move around on my wrist, which means it's comfortable enough. Um, it's going to stay put, but it's, it's slightly loose on the looser side without being loose in any way. So... Those micro adjusts, even if with just two of them, it works perfectly. I was able to go from four to, so five links removed to four links removed. So what I'm basically saying is that it works pretty well with just two micro adjusts because the links are fairly short. 
Um, but having said that, it's going to have three, so I don't think that's an issue. Sure, we see watches with six micro adjusts and whatever, but really to do these adaptions to get it comfortable on your wrist, two worked perfectly. I could go between adding and removing a link because uh, I had this kind of awkward wrist size that was just between the two sizes. So that worked for me. Um, I'm finding this an extremely comfortable watch on the wrist as well. Um, because you see that first link is actually uh, female. Um, uh, and so it's basically very comfortable and the three micro adjust should not be an issue. While I am talking about the bracelet just briefly, um, you might be able to spot some uh, ish, slight, small issues with the uh, end links. Don't know how well the camera is going to pick that up. Maybe it won't pick them up too well. There are actually a couple of slight marks kind of just here and here on the inner link. Um, and that's just basically not very good finishing. So they're going to redo the end links and come up with a slightly better design. Um, but it's going to be the same shape, but they're they, they weren't happy with the finishing. So great attention to detail, which is always a big plus. When I hear that from the microband, I didn't even ask them, but they just told me, asked, I just asked them, what are your differences? I don't point out the issues I, I have in a review. And they just told me up front, oh, we're going to be changing the end link. We're not happy with it. We're going to make it a little bit better. It's going to be the same shape, but basically the finishing uh, is not quite right, so we just improved that a bit. So uh, definitely a big plus there. So in terms of the other specs on this watch, you've got the sizes here. It's a 5 ATM rating, so 50 meters water resistant, which is what you'd expect with a watch with pushes, basically, if they're not screw down pushes. So um, that's really good. It's not 3 ATM. Uh, would have expected 5 uh, from a good brand. Um, I mentioned sapphire crystal on the back, which is good. Now, they do say it has flame blued hands and also BGW9 loom. Uh, so let me get into that a little bit too. So um, I don't know how well we can get close on these hands here. Let's see um, if you can pick up some of the blue on the hands. These might well indeed be flame blued hands, but under normal outdoor lighting, they were looking to be a very bright blue consistently from many directions, and they look very similar to chemically blued hands that I have on some other watches. So I might just not be the guy who can spot the difference. Quite possible. Um, not an expert on everything. Um, and these might well indeed be flame blued hands, but I got the impression that the hands might have been mechanically blued, but again, this is a prototype and they might be paying extra for the production. Uh, so that's one thing to keep in mind. And then the other thing, and I'll do this at the end of the video, turn the lights down so we can play with the loom a little bit, uh, was that they're saying it's BGW9 loom, which basically glows blue. Uh, they are up front and they're completely candid that um, because they've got a fair amount of color on their hands, the BGW9 isn't as strong as it could be. Well, um, that's pretty upfront of any brand to say that. Well, that's going to be the case. BGW9 is kind of like a naturally a white color in daylight. So if you've got any other color, they, they have to mix some of the color, the pigment up uh, with the loom. So it, it kind of weakens the strength of the loom a little bit. But I don't think anybody's going to be going in for this watch for the loom in particular. And it does have a really nice old vintage look to it. But uh, you know, I don't think, you know, loom is the deciding factor. It's the mono pusher here that everyone who is interested in this watch would like to go for. So um, a few other differences. Uh, I mentioned three micro adjusts, and I also mentioned um, uh, the end links on the bracelet are going to be improved. Um, also on the back, you probably can't see this so clearly, uh, but right now this doesn't have a swan neck regulator. Uh, I can talk about that in another video just to keep this one fairly short, because I do tend to waffle. Uh, so I'll link to another video explaining what a swan neck regulator is. However, the production version will have a swan neck regulator, and that's another plus too. A swan neck, neck regulator will let you um, adjust the accuracy of the watch slightly faster, slightly slower, by fairly fixed increments by turning a screw a certain amount in one direction, clockwise or anti-clockwise, uh, which is a little bit easier than, um, and I'll get into the, pros and cons in another video if you're interested in this, but it's usually a little bit easier if you don't have a time graph for your own machine to measure the accuracy and you just want to kind of play, it's, uh, it feels a bit faster, let's make it a bit slower. You can train, change the speed by a fairly uniform amount, so you can maybe give half a turn in one direction, make it 
slower, find that's a little bit too slow, so a quarter of a turn back the other way. It's, it's pretty easy to adjust it over a couple of days without a time grapher to make the watch fairly accurate for how you wear it. Uh, how a watch is worn will affect how accurately it's running. You know, dial up might run a little bit faster than a different position. If you wear it on your right wrist, because uh, you're left-handed like me, the crown will be facing up when you're walking and uh, your crown will be facing down if you are right-handed and wear it on your left wrist. So definitely some differences. Everybody's going to wear their watches a little bit different. I sit at a desk in front of a computer and I have my hand, right hand on the watch on and I'm using a mouse. So I tend to have dial up quite a bit. So um, my accuracy adjustment for a watch is going to be different to someone else's. So having a swan neck regulator is a great thing. The other side of the coin, however, is you get a two-year manufacturer's warranty with this. I don't know the terms of the warranty, but typically it's reasonable for a manufacturer to not provide a warranty if you've opened up the watch and tinkered inside. So the Swan Neck Regulator is kind of a two-edged sword. It gives you the ability to regulate a watch if you need to regulate it better than the minus five to plus ten seconds per day that they're going to be going for here. Um, but at the cost of potentially losing the warranty. So my recommendation would be take it as it is direct from the brand. It's reasonably accurate to start with. And after a couple of years when you don't have a warranty and you want to maybe adjust it or, or even after it's been serviced, then make that adjustment. Or if you're really comfortable with watches, you could probably get away with it. It's a nice screw down case back, very easy to open if you've got the right watch tools. So if you know what you're doing, you don't have to be a master watchmaker, you can regulate your watch basically, uh, using obviously the appropriate care and keeping in mind the uh, warranty situation. So um, that is pretty much this watch in a nutshell. Um, definitely there's some pros and cons. Um, the I think it's, you know, the way they price this is a little bit awkward because a typical ST19 is like 350, 400, 450 pre-order, maybe 500, 550 retail. And this is going to be costing a fair bit more, almost basically $700 or $800, depending uh, on whether you get it on pre-order or not. Still much cheaper than any mechanical alternative than an ST19. Uh, and the only one, Monoprosha, that I've seen out there for less than a couple of grand or maybe even more than that. So... Um, Definitely good value if you want a mono pusher, but the price point, if you, if the mono pusher isn't the thing and you're buying a watch just for the looks, I think they, they've kind of made it a little bit awkward. I can see that it needs to cost more with the amount of work they're putting in on the watch and the machinery that they're using. Uh, you know, it's not a cheap, CNC machines are not cheap, you know. I don't know how much they cost, but you could be paying tens of thousands of dollars for, for that kind of a thing. And obviously they've got future plans, but they're putting all their eggs in one basket with this first release here. Um, but still, I was thinking to myself, if this was priced a little bit higher, maybe this is um, roughly $200 more than a typical market price point, or, two, or $250 more. If they were like $100 more, I think this would possibly um, grab even more interest than it has done. Um, but you know, so that's one. It's not really a negative because you are saving a huge amount of money if you want a mono pusher. Um, but at the, but at the same time, they're kind of uh, pricing themselves out of the ballpark a little bit for people that are just buying the watch because they like the looks of it, and that's the primary reason. So they might be losing a bit to that market, but definitely they've made a very vintage inspired watch uh, with fairly traditional design cues. Uh, that's a mono pusher, so they are trying to appeal to somebody who's a watch collector. So a very niche market. I hope they do well because I really want to see what they come up with next. Um, and it's certainly an interesting watch. If you have any questions, uh, do let me know. I'll be more than happy to answer them. And, uh, oh, I almost forgot. Sorry, these are also screwed links on the bracelet. I didn't mention that. So this is what happens when I do everything in a single take. So basically you need a 1.2 millimeter flathead screwdriver. It, it doesn't come with that. Um, would be a nice touch for the price if they were to include it. Um, but anyway, you can get one of these from like a, a dollar store or get one of these from your local hardware store for a pretty much pocket change. And basically, you know, this just screws in one end and then it just comes out. All these links came out super easy. Um, you know, basically I've got four links out now, but I had five, you know, I was playing around. 
so they didn't use any glue because the links are large enough, uh, sorry, the screws are large enough that you don't need to glue them in. The fit and finish was extremely good, so very easy to resize your bracelet. I don't think people would go to the rubber straps, uh, sorry, the leather straps, uh, which would be calfskin, because the bracelet itself is pretty decent. Very comfortable, as I said, so easy to adjust, very comfortable. I didn't even have to take the bracelet off the watch to unscrew and make the adjustments. What I normally do is I... I use uh, the pin end of a um, spring bar tool, it's a, basically a, a fairly affordable spring bar tool and it's got a pin end just to push out the micro adjust uh, spring bar, take it off so the watch is open and then I unscrew the links that way um, while the watch is open and I, I usually wrap this in a cloth just to be safe uh, but I, I didn't really need to pop the uh, bracelet off the watch at all. Um, so all in all, it's a very good, interesting package. I mean, if you don't have a monopusher, I think, and you really want to have one to your collection and you don't have a monopusher, this is the one to go for. I don't think you'll find anything cheaper. I could be wrong. If you know of another micro brand that's selling a monopusher, I don't in fact know of any micro brands selling monopushers right now. So, um, you know, I mean, let, let, it, let me know in the comments as well. So definitely the value is there for somebody who wants to add an interesting watch to their collection. Uh, I think the price point is still decent compared to um, a 7750 because this is a watch that's been, you know, ta taken apart, stripped, cleaned, lubed, rebuilt, had parts replaced and is running exceptionally well, better than a any 7750 I own. I own several well, more than several. I own a number of 7750s and a fairly huge number at this point of uh, SD19s because it's my favorite um, so in terms of chronographs. So, um, yeah, definitely I've not felt one that feels as good as this. And that's saying a lot. I know you can't really see it on a video, but um, so the feel of this is excellent. That's worth some extra money for me. This is going to be a long lasting watch. And if something accidental happens, like maybe I drop it or something, um, if I was keeping it, I'd be really happy with a watch running like this. So um, very happy with this watch. I think it's good value if you want to get a monopusher. And that is the one question that you probably need to ask yourself. Otherwise, you could probably get a more affordable ST19, uh, but you're not going to have one that will run as nicely as this uh, with this interesting feature. So Pretty much, I think that nails it for me. Um, I would be interested in backing this, except for the fact that I have backed too many watches recently. Um, and so I'm going to be passing this time around. But I'm keen to keep a really close eye on what these guys are going to be doing next. And I really hope it's something like a flyback, because I will be all over that. I've been after a flyback for the longest time. So um, if you have any questions, let me know. And thanks for watching. And we'll just switch over and do some loom shots. So um, as you can see, in the loom shot, the uh, minute and hour hands are quite strong, and the uh, you know the indices, the one through the twelve, the hour indices are quite weak. Now, to be fair, this hasn't been charged for hours in daylight. I put a UV torch in it for like ten seconds. Plus, it's had a, a little bit of time uh, while I was doing the review earlier, uh, a minute or two ago. Well, I just finished that review, but it's been in a box, and, and except for the last half hour or so. Uh, but still, you could see uh, the hands are fine, and they'll probably be fine for quite some time. They're quite strongly loomed, but the dial is pretty weak. Um, so nothing to write home about, but certainly very acceptable, and it's a nice, interesting vintage color loom. So again, that's it for me. Um, hope this review was useful, and uh, again, let me know if you have any questions.